Hassan ibn Bakquot Ali ibn Abi Talib, commonly called Hassan, was the second Shiite imam, succeeding his father Ali and preceding his younger brother Hussein ibn Ali. He was the eldest son of Ali and Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. Muslims respect him as the grandson of Muhammad and a member of Ahl al-Bayt and Ahl al kissa After the death of his father, Hassan also succeeded him as Rashid un Caliph. He abdicated after six or seven months, and Muawiyah, who became the first Umayyad Caliph, succeeded him. His wife, Jada bint al Asharat, is commonly accused of having poisoned him at the instigation of Muawiyah. Birth and early life Hassan was born in the year 625 and grew up in Medina with his parents. According to Shiite belief, theirs was the only house that Archangel Gabriel allowed to have a door to the courtyard of the Al-Masjid al-Nabawi, the Mosque of the Prophet. Both Shia and Sunni Muslims consider Hassan to belong to the Ahl al-Bayt, the family of Muhammad, and to the Ahl al kissa the participants of the event of Mubahala. It is said that Muhammad slaughtered a ram for the poor on the occasion of Hassan's birth, and chose the name Hassan for him. Fatima shaved his head and gave the weight of his hair in silver as arms. There are many narrations showing the respect of Muhammad toward his grandsons, including the statement that his two grandsons would be the lords of the youth of paradise and that they were imams whether they stand up or sit down, and also his prediction that Hassan would make peace between two factions of Muslims. In his later years Hassan was one of the guards defending Uthman ibn Affan when the attackers went around him and killed him, and also a participant of Battle of Sifan and Narawi and alongside his father, Ahl al kissa in the year 10 a Christian envoy from Najran came to Muhammad to argue which of the two parties erred in its doctrine concerning Iso. After likening Jesus a miraculous birth to Adam's creation, who was born to neither a mother nor a father, and when the Christians did not accept the Islamic doctrine about Jesus, Muhammad was instructed to call them to Mubahala where each party should ask God to destroy the false party and their families. If anyone dispute with you in this matter concerning Jesus after the knowledge which has come to you, say, Come let us call our sons and your sons, our women and your women, ourselves and yourselves. Then let us swear an oath and place the curse of God on those who lie. Sunnit historians, except Tabari who do not name the participants, mention Muhammad, Fatima, Hassan and Hussein, and some agree with the Shiite tradition that Ali was also among the participants in this event on the side of Muhammad. Accordingly, in the verse of Mubahala the words, our sons, is representative of Hassan and Hussein, our women, would refer to Fatima, and ourselves, would be, Ali, his imamati, caliphate. According to Donaldson there was not a significant difference between the idea of imamati, or divine right expressed by each imam designating his successor and other ideas of succession at first. Ali had apparently failed to nominate a successor before he died, however, on several occasions expressed his idea that only the prophets Ahl al were entitled to rule the community, and Hassan, whom he had appointed his inheritor, must have been the obvious choice, as he was also chosen by the people as the next caliph. Sunnis, on the other hand, reject Imam Ati on the basis of Quran which says Muhammad, as the last of the prophets, was not to be succeeded by any of his family, and that is why God let Muhammad's sons to die in infancy. This is why Muhammad did not nominate a successor, as he wanted to leave the succession to be resolved by the Muslim community on the basis of the Quranic principle of consultation. The question Madalung proposes here is why the family members of Muhammad should not inherit other aspects of Muhammad's character such as rule, wisdom, and the imamati. 
Since the Sunni concept of the true caliphate itself defines it as a succession of the Prophet in every respect except his prophethood, Madalung further asks, if God really wanted to indicate that he should not be succeeded by any of his family, why did he not let his grandsons and other kin die like his sons? It is said that one day the Abbasid Caliph Harun al-Rashid questioned the seventh Shiite Imam, Musa al qadim saying why he had permitted people to call him the son of Allah's apostle, while he and his forefathers were Muhammad's daughter's children, and that the progeny belongs to the male and not to the female. In response al qadim recited the verses Quran 6-84 and Quran 6-85 and then asked, Who is Jesus's father, O commander of the faithful? Jesus had no father, said Harun. al qadim argued that God in the these verses had ascribed Jesus to the descendants of the prophets through Mary. Similarly, we have been ascribed to the descendants of the prophet through our mother Fatima, said al qadim It is related that Harun asked Musa to give him more evidence and proof. al qadim thus recited the verse of Mubahale arguing that none claims that the prophet made someone enter under the cloak when he challenged the Christians to a contest of prayer to God except Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein. So in the verse, our sons, refers to Hassan and Hussein. In any case, after Ali was assassinated and following the custom established by Abu Bakr, Hassan made a speech at the Mosque of Kufa praising the merits of his family and quoting the verses of the Quran which exalts the special position of the Ahl al-Bayt and said, I am of the family of the Prophet from whom God has removed filth and whom he has purified, whose love he has made obligatory in his book when he said, Whosoever performs a good act, we shall increase the good in it. Performing a good act is love for us. The family of the Prophet, Qiz ibn Sa'd was the first to give allegiance to him and then stipulated the condition that the Bayas should be based on, on the Quran, the Sunnah of Muhammad, and on the condition of the war against those who declared lawful that which is sinful. Hassan, however, tried to avoid the last condition by saying that it was implicitly included in the first two, as if he knew, as Jeffrey put it. From the very beginning of the Iraqis' lack of resolution in time of trials, and thus Hassan wanted to avoid commitment to an extreme stand which might lead to complete disaster. With Muawiyah, correspondence as soon as the news of Hassan's selection reached Muawiyah, who had been fighting Ali for the Caliphate, he condemned the selection and declared his decision not to recognize him. Letters exchanged between Hassan and Muawiyah before their troops faced each other were to no avail. However, these letters, which were recorded in Madalung and Jaffrey's books, provide useful arguments concerning the rights of caliphate which will lead to the origin of Shiism. In one of his long letters to Muawiyah, summoning him to pledge allegiance to him, Hassan made use of the argument of his father, Ali, which the latter had advanced against Abu Bakr after the death of Muhammad. Ali had said, if Qurayish could claim the leadership over the answer on the grounds that the Prophet belonged to Qurayish, then the members of his family, who were the nearest to him in every respect, were better qualified for the leadership of the community. Muawiyah's response to this argument is also interesting. For Muawiyah, while recognizing the excellence of the Muhammad's family, further asserted that he would willingly follow Hassan's request were it not for his own superior experience in governing. You are asking me to settle the matter peacefully and surrender. But the situation concerning you and me today is like the one between you, your family, and Abu Bakr after the death of the Prophet. I have a longer period of reign, probably referring to his governorship, and I am more experienced, better in policies, and older in age than you. If you enter into obedience to me now, you will accede to the Caliphate after me. In his book, The Origins and Early Development of Shia Islam, Jaffrey comes to the conclusion that the majority of the Muslims, who became known as Sunnis afterwards, place the religious leadership in the totality of the community, represented by the ulama. 
as the custodian of religion and the exponent of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, while accepting state authority as binding, a minority of the Muslims, on the other hand, could not find satisfaction for their religious aspirations except in the charismatic leadership from among the people of the House of the Prophet. The Ahl al-Bayt, as the sole exponents of the Quran and the prophetic Sunnah, although this minority too had to accept the state's authority. This group was called the Shiite. Facing the troops there was more corresponding with no result so as negotiations stalled, and Muawiyah summoned all the commanders of his forces in Syria, Palestine, and Transjordan, and began preparations for war. Soon later he marched his army of 60,000 men through Mesopotamia to Marskan, on the Tigris boundary of Mosul towards the Sawad. Meanwhile, he attempted to negotiate with Hassan, sending the young heir letters asking him to give up his claim. According to Jaffre, Muawiyah hoped to either force Hassan to come to terms, or attack the Iraqi forces before they had time to strengthen their location. However, Jaffrey says, Muawiyah knew if Hassan was defeated and killed, he was still her threat. 4. Another member of the clan of Hashem could simply claim to be his successor, should he abdicate in favor of Muawiyah. However, such claims would have no weight and Muawiyah's position would be guaranteed. According to Jaffrey this policy proved to be correct, for even ten years later, after the death of Hassan, when Iraqis turned to his younger brother, Hussein, concerning an uprising, Hassan instructed them to wait as long as Muawiyah was alive due to Hassan's peace treaty with him. As the news of Muawiyah's army reached Hassan, he sent someone to his local governors ordering them to get ready to set out then addressed the people of the Kufa with a lukewarm war speech. God had prescribed the jihad for his creation and called it a loathsome duty. There was no response at first, as some tribal chiefs, paid by Muawiyah, were reluctant to move. Hassan's companions scolded him, asking whether they won't answer to the son of the Prophet's daughter. Turning to Hassan they assured him of their obedience, and immediately left for the war camp. Hassan admired them and later joined them at al nukaila where people were coming together in large groups. Hassan appointed Ubaid Allah ibn al-Abbas as the commander of his vanguard of 12,000 men to move to Maskan. There he should keep back Muawiyah until Hassan arrived with the main army. Ubaid Allah was advised not to fight unless attacked and should consult with Qiz ibn Sa'd who was appointed as second in command if he were killed. Hassan's sermon and its aftermath while Hassan's vanguard was waiting for his arrival at Maskan. Hassan himself was facing a serious problem at Sabat near al Madin, where he gave a sermon after morning prayer in which he declared that he prayed to God to be the most sincere of his creation to his creation, that he bore no resentment nor hatred against any Muslim, nor did he want evil and harm to anyone, and that whatever they hated in community was better than what they loved in schism. He was, he continued, looking after their best interest, better than they themselves, and instructed them not to disobey whatever orders he gave them. Some of the troops, taking this as a sign that Hassan was preparing to give up battle, rebelled against him, looted his tent seizing even the prayer rug from underneath him. Hassan shouted for his horse and rode off surrounded by his partisans who kept back those who were trying to reach him. While they were passing by Sabbat, however, al jarrah ibn Sinar, a die-hard Qarijit, managed to ambush Hassan and wounded him in the thigh with a dagger, while he was shouting, God is the greatest. You have become an infidel like your father before you. Abd Allah ibn al Hisl jumped upon him, and his others joined in. Al Dara was overpowered and died. Al Hassan was taken to Al Madarin where he was cared for by his governor, Sad ibn Masud al Thakafi. The news of this attack, having been spread by Muawiyah, further demoralized the already discouraged army of Hassan and led to extensive desertion from his troops. Hassan's vanguard at al maskan when Ubaid Allah with the Kufan vanguard arrived al maskan where Muawiyah had already reached, 
The latter sent an envoy to tell them that he had received letters from Hassan asking for an armistice and that he asked the Kufans not to attack until he finished his negotiations with Hassan. Muawiyah's claim was probably untrue, but he had good reason to think that he could make Hassan to give in. The Kufans, however, insulted Muawiyah's envoy and reviled him. Next Muawiyah sent the envoy to visit Ubaid Allah in private, and to swore to him that Hassan had requested Muawiyah for a truce, and that Muawiyah was offering Ubaid Allah one million dirhams, half of which to be paid at once, the other half in Kufa, provided he went over to him. Ubaid Allah accepted and abandoned at night to Muawiyah's camp. Muawiyah was extremely pleased and fulfilled his promise to him. Next morning the Kufans waited for Ubaid Allah to emerge and lead the morning prayer. Then Qiz ibn Sa'd took charge and, in his sermon, severely denounced Ubaid Allah, his father and his brother, from whom nothing good had ever come. The people shouted. Praise be to God that he has removed him from us, stand up with us against our enemy, believing that the abandonment of Abayd Allah had broken the spirit of his enemy. Muawiyu sent BUSR with a troop to make them give up. Keys attacked and drove him back. The next day BUSR attacked with a larger troop but was kept back again. Muawiyah now sent a letter to Keyes offering bribes but Keyes replied that he would never meet him except with a lance between him, as the news of the riot against Hassan and of his having been wounded arrived. However, both sides abstained from fighting to wait for further news. Abdicating to Muawiyah Muawiyah who had already started negotiations with Hassan, now sent high-level envoys, while committing himself in a witness letter to appoint Hassan his successor and give him whatever he wished. Hassan accepted the offer in principle and sent Amr ibn Salima al-Hamdani al habl and his own brother-in-law Muhammad ibn al-Asharath back to Muawiyah as his negotiators. Together with the envoys of the latter, Muawiyah then wrote a letter saying that he was making peace with Hassan on the basis that Hassan would inherit the reign after him. He swore that he would not seek to harm him, and that he would give him one million dirhams from the treasury annually, along with the land tax of FASA and Arab Jid, to which Hassan was to send his own tax agents to collect it. The letter was witnessed by the four envoys and dated in August 661. When al-Hassan read the letter he commented, He is trying to appeal to my greed for a matter which, if I desired it, I would not surrender to him. Then he sent Abdallah ibn al-Harith, whose mother Hind was Muawiyah's sister, to Muawiyah, instructing him, Go to your uncle and tell him. If you grant safety to the people I shall pledge allegiance to you, after which Muawiyah gave him a blank paper with his seal at the bottom, inviting Hassan to write on it whatever he desired. According to Jaffrey, historians like Yaguba and al-Masudi do not mention the terms of peace treaty at all. Other historians such as Dinawari, Ibn Abd al-Bar and Ibn al-Atir records different accounts of the conditions. And the timing of the black sheet sent by Muawiyah to Hassan was confusing into Bari's account, the most comprehensive account, which explains the different ambiguous accounts of other sources, according to Jaffrey, is given by Ahmad ibn Atham, which must have taken it from al-Madarini. Madalung's view is close to that of Jaffrey when he stipulates that Hassan surrendered the reign over the Muslims to Muawiyah on the basis that he act. According to the Book of God, the Sunnah of his Prophet and the conducts of the righteous Caliphs, Muawiyah should not be entitled to appoint his success but that there should be an electoral council, the people would be safe, wherever they were, with respect to their person, their property and their offspring. Muawiyah would not seek any wrong against Hassan secretly or openly and would not intimidate any of his companions. The letter was testified by Abdallah ibn al-Harith and Amr ibn Salima and transmitted by them to Muawiyah for him to take recognition of its contents and to confirm his acceptance. 
Hassan thus surrendered his control of Iraq in Rabi 241, August 661 after a reign of seven months. Surrender ceremony at Kufa after the peace treaty with Hassan, Muawiyah set out with his troops to Kufa, where at a public surrender ceremony Hassan rose and reminded the people that he and Hussein were the only grandsons of Muhammad, and that he had surrendered the reign to Muawiyah in the best interest of the community. Zero people, surely it was God who led you by the first of us and who has spared you bloodshed by the last of us. I have made peace with Muawiyah, and I know not whether haply this be not for your trial, and that ye may enjoy yourselves for a time, declared Hassan. In his own speech Muawiyah told him, the reason why he had fought them was not to make them pray, fast perform the pilgrimage, and give alms, because they had been already doing those. In fact he had fought to be their commander and leader, and God had bestowed him that against their will. According to some sources, he also said, The agreement I made with Hassan is null and void. It lies trampled under my feet. Then he shouted, God's protection is dissolved from anyone who does not come forth and pledge allegiance. Surely, I have sought revenge for the blood of Uthman. May God kill his murderers and have returned the reign to those to whom it belongs in spite of the rancor of some people. We grant respite to three nights. Whoever has not pledged allegiance by then will have no protection and no pardon. The people rushed from every direction to vow allegiance. While still camping outside Kufa, Muawiyah faced a Kari Jeet revolt. He sent a cavalry troop against him, but they were beaten back. Muawiyah now sent after Hassan, who had already left for Medina, and commanded him to return and fight against the Qarijites. Hassan, who had reached Al-Qadashir, wrote back, I have abandoned the fight against you, even though it was my legal right, for the sake of peace and reconciliation of the community.